Chapter 15 The truck rumbled up to the perimeter gate and stopped. Krannon waved to the guards through the front window, then closed a metal shield over it. When the gates swung open, the truck, really a giant armored tank, ground slowly forward. There was a second gate beyond the first that did not open until the interior one was closed. Jason looked through the second driver's periscope as the outer gate lifted. Automatic flamethrowers flared through the opening, cutting off only when the truck reached them. A scorched area ringed the gate. Beyond that, the jungle began. Unconsciously, Jason shrank back in his seat. All the plants and animals he had seen only specimens of existed here in profusion. Thorn-ringed branches and vines laced themselves into a solid mat through which the wildlife swarmed. A fury of sound hurled at them, thuds and scratchings rang on the armor. Krannon laughed and closed the switch that electrified the outer grid. The scratchings died away as the beasts completed the circuit to the grounded hull. It was slow-speed, low-gear work tearing through the jungle. Krannon had his face buried in the periscope mask and silently fought the controls. With each mile the going seemed to get better, until he finally swung up the periscope and opened the window armor. The jungle was still thick and deadly, but nothing like the area immediately around the perimeter. It appeared as if most of the lethal powers of Pyrus were concentrated in the single area around the settlement. Why? Jason asked himself. Why this intense and planetary hatred? The motors died and Krannon stood up, stretching. We're here, he said. Let's unload. There was bare rock around the truck, a rounded hillock that projected from the jungle, too smooth and steep for vegetation to get a hold. Krannon opened the cargo hatches and they pushed out the boxes and crates. When they finished, Jason slumped down, exhausted, onto the pile. Get back in. We're leaving, Krannon said. You are. I'm staying right here. Krannon looked at him coldly. Get in the truck or I'll kill you. No one stays out here. For one thing, you couldn't live an hour alone. But worse than that, the grubbers would get you. Kill you at once, of course, but that's not important. But you have equipment that we can't allow into their hands. You want to see a grubber with a gun? While the Pyron talked, Jason's thoughts had rushed ahead. He hoped that Krannon was as thick of head as he was fast of reflex. Jason looked at the trees, let his gaze move up through the thick branches. Though Krannon was still talking, he was automatically aware of Jason's attention. When Jason's eyes widened and his gun jumped into his hand, Krannon's own gun appeared and he turned in the same direction. There, in the top, Jason shouted, and fired into the tangle of branches. Krannon fired, too. As soon as he did, Jason hurled himself backwards, curled into a ball rolling down the inclined rock. The shots had covered the sounds of his movements, and before Krannon could turn back, the gravity had dragged him down the rock into the thick foliage. Crashing branches slapped at him, but slowed his fall. When he stopped moving, he was lost in the tangle. Krannon's shots came too late to hit him. Lying there, tired and bruised, Jason heard the Pyron cursing him out. He stamped around the rock, fired a few shots, but knew better than to enter the trees. Finally he gave up and went back to the truck. The motor gunned into life and the treads clanked and scraped down the rock and back into the jungle. There were muted rumblings and crashes that slowly died away. Then Jason was alone. Up until that instant he hadn't realized quite how alone he would be. Surrounded by nothing but death, the truck already vanished from sight, he had to force down an overwhelming desire to run after it. What was done, was done. This was a long chance to take, but it was the only way to contact the grubbers. They were savages, but still they had come from human stock, and they hadn't sunk so low as to stop barter with the civilized pirates. He had to contact them, befriend them, find out how they had managed to live safely on this madhouse world. If there had been another way to lick the problem, he would have taken it. He didn't relish the role of martyred hero, but Kirk and his deadline had forced his hand. The contact had to be made fast, and this was the only way. There was no telling where the savages were or how soon they would arrive. If the woods weren't too lethal, he could hide there, pick his time to approach them. If they found him among the supplies, they might skewer him on the spot with a typical Pyron reflex. Walking warily, he approached the line of trees. Something moved on a branch, but vanished as he came near. None of the plants near a thick-trunked tree looked poisonous, so he slipped behind it. There was nothing deadly in sight, and it surprised him. He let his body relax a bit, leaning against the rough bark. 
Something soft and choking fell over his head. His body was seized in a steel grip. The more he struggled, the tighter it held him until the blood thundered in his ears and his lungs screamed for air. Only when he grew limp did the pressure let up. His first panic ebbed a little when he realized that it wasn't an animal that attacked him. He knew nothing about the grubbers, but they were human, so he still had a chance. His arms and legs were tied, the power holster ripped from his arm. He felt strangely naked without it. The powerful hands grabbed him again, and he was hurled into the air to fall face down across something warm and soft. Fear pressed in again. It was a large animal of some kind, and all Pyrran animals were deadly. When the animal moved off carrying him, panic was replaced by a feeling of mounting elation. The grubbers had managed to work out a truce of some kind with at least one form of animal life. He had to find out how. If he could get that secret, and get it back to the city, it would justify all his work and pain. It might even justify wealth's death if the age-old war could be slowed or stopped. Jason's tightly bound limbs hurt terribly at first, but grew numb with the circulation shut off. The jolting ride continued endlessly. He had no way of measuring the time. A rainfall soaked him, then he felt his clothes steaming as the sun came out. The ride was finally over. He was pulled from the animal's back and dumped down. His arms dropped free as someone loosed the bindings. The returning circulation soaked him in pain as he lay there, struggling to move. When his hands finally obeyed him, he lifted them to his face and stripped away the covering. A sack of thick fur. Light blinded him as he sucked in breath after breath of clean air. Blinking against the glare, he looked around. He was lying on a floor of crude planking, the setting sun shining into his eyes through the doorless entrance of the building. There was a plowed field outside, stretching down the curve of hill to the edge of the jungle. It was too dark to see much inside the hut. Something blocked the light of the doorway, a tall, animal-like figure. On second look, Jason realized it was a man with long hair and thick beard. He was dressed in furs, even his legs were wrapped in fur leggings. His eyes were fixed on his captive, while one hand fondled an axe that hung from his waist. "'Who are you? What do you want?' the bearded man asked suddenly. Jason picked his words slowly, wondering if this savage shared the same hair-trigger temper as the city-dwellers. "'My name is Jason. I come in peace. I want to be your friend.' "'Lies!' the man grunted and pulled the axe from his belt. "'Junk man tricks. I saw you hide. Wait to kill me. Kill you first. He tested the edge of the blade with a horny thumb, then raised it. Wait, Jason said desperately, you don't understand. The axe swung down. I'm from off-world, and— A solid thunk shook him as the axe buried itself in the wood next to his head. At the last instant the man had twitched it aside. He grabbed the front of Jason's clothes and pulled him up until their faces touched. It's true, he shouted, you from off-world? His hand opened and Jason dropped back before he could answer. The savage jumped over him towards the dim rear of the hut. Reese must know of this, he said as he fumbled with something on the wall. Light sprang out. All Jason could do was stare. The hairy, fur-covered savage was operating a communicator. The calloused, dirt-encrusted fingers deftly snapped open the circuits and dialed a number. Chapter 16 It made no sense. Jason tried to reconcile the modern machine with the barbarian and couldn't. Who was he calling? The existence of one communicator meant there was at least another. Was Reese a person or a thing? With a mental effort he grabbed hold of his thoughts and braked them to a stop. There was something new here, factors he hadn't counted on. He kept reassuring himself that there was an explanation for everything once you had the facts straight. Jason closed his eyes, shutting out the glaring rays of the sun where it cut through the treetops, and reconsidered his facts. They separated evenly into two classes, those he had observed for himself and those he had learned from the city-dwellers. This last class of facts he would hold, to see if they fitted with what he learned. There was a good chance that most or all of them would prove false. Get up, the voice jarred into his thoughts. We're leaving. His legs were still numb and hardly usable. The bearded man snorted in disgust and hauled him to his feet, propping him against the outer wall. Jason clutched the knobby bark of the logs when he was left alone. He looked around, soaking up impressions. It was the first time he had been on a farm since he had run away from home. A different world with a different ecology, but the similarity was apparent enough to him. A new sown field stretched down the hill in front of the shack, plowed by a good farmer. 
even well-cast furrows that followed the contour of the slope. Another large log building was next to this one, probably a barn. There was a snuffling sound behind him and Jason turned quickly and froze. His hand called for the missing gun and his fingers tightened down on a trigger that wasn't there. It had come out of the jungle and padded up quietly behind him. It had six thick legs with clawed feet that dug into the ground. The two-meter-long body was covered with matted yellow and black fur, all except the skull and shoulders. These were covered with overlapping horny plates. Jason could see all this because the beast was that close. He waited to die. The mouth opened, a frog-like division of the hairless skull revealing double rows of jagged teeth. Here, Fido, the bearded man said, coming up behind Jason and snapping his fingers at the same time. The thing bounded forward, brushing past the dazed Jason and rubbed his head against the man's leg. Nice doggy, the man said, his fingers scratching under the edge of the carapace where it joined the flesh. The bearded man had brought two of the riding animals out of the barn, saddled and bridled. Jason barely noticed the details of smooth skin and long legs as he swung up on one. His feet were quickly lashed to the stirrups. When they started, the skull-headed beast followed them. Nice doggy, Jason said, and for no reason started to laugh. The bearded man turned and scowled at him until he was quiet. By the time they entered the jungle, it was dark. It was impossible to see under the thick foliage, and they used no lights. The animals seemed to know the way. There were scraping noises and shrill calls from the jungle around them, but it did not bother Jason too much. Perhaps the automatic manner in which the other man undertook the journey reassured him, or the presence of the dog that he felt rather than saw. The trip was a long one, but not too uncomfortable. The regular motion of the animal and his fatigue overcame Jason, and he dozed into a fitful sleep, waking with a start each time he slumped forward. In the end he slept sitting up in the saddle. Hours passed this way until he opened his eyes and saw a square of light before them. The trip was over. His legs were stiff and galled with saddle sores. After his feet were untied, getting down was an effort, and he almost fell. A door opened and Jason went in. It took his eyes some moments to get used to the light until he could make out the form of a man on the bed before him. Come over here and sit down. The voice was full and strong, accustomed to command. The body was that of an invalid. A blanket covered him to the waist. Above that the flesh was sickly white, spotted with red nodules and hung loosely over the bones. There seemed to be nothing left of the man except skin and skeleton. Not very nice, the man on the bed said, but I've grown used to it. His tone changed abruptly. Naxa said you were from off-world. Is that true? Jason nodded yes, and his answer stirred the living skeleton to life. The head lifted from the pillow, and the red-rimmed eyes sought his with a desperate intensity. My name is Reese, and I'm a... grubber. Will you help me? Jason wondered at the intensity of Reese's question, all out of proportion to the simple content of its meaning. Yet he could see no reason to give anything other than the first and obvious answer that sprang to his lips. Of course I'll help you in whatever way I can, as long as it involves no injury to anyone else. What do you want? The sick man's head had fallen back limply, exhausted, as Jason talked, but the fire still burned in his eyes. Feel assured. I want to injure no others, Reese said. Quite the opposite. As you see, I am suffering from a disease that our remedies will not stop. Within a few more days I will be dead. Now I have seen the city people using a device. They press it over a wound or an animal bite. Do you have one of these machines? That sounds like a description of the med kit. Jason touched the button at his waist that dropped the med kit into his hand. I have mine here. It analyzes and treats most. Would you use it on me? Reese broke in, his voice suddenly urgent. I'm sorry, Jason said. I, I should have realized. He stepped forward and pressed the machine over one of the inflamed areas on Reese's chest. The operation light came on and the thin shaft of the analyzer probe slid down. When it withdrew, the device hummed, then clicked three times as three separate hypodermic needles lanced into the skin. Then the light went out. Is that all? Reese asked as he watched Jason stow the med kit back in his belt. Jason nodded, then looked up and noticed the wet marks of tears on the sick man's face. Reese became aware at the same time and brushed at them angrily. When a man is sick, he growled, the body and all its senses become traitor. 
I don't think I've cried since I was a child, but you must realize it's not for myself I'm crying for, it's the untold thousands of my people who have died for lack of that little device you treat so casually. Surely you have medicines, doctors of your own. Herb doctors and witch doctors, Rhys said, consigning them all to oblivion with a chop of his hand. The few hard-working and honest men are hampered by the fact that the faith healers can usually cure better than their strongest potion. The talking had tired Reese. He stopped suddenly and closed his eyes. On his chest the inflamed areas were already losing their angry color as the injections took effect. Jason glanced around the room, looking for clues to the mystery of these people. Floors and walls were made of wood lengths fitted together, free of paint or decoration. They looked simple and crude, fit only for the savages he had expected to meet. Or were they crude? The wood had a sweeping flame-like grain. When he bent close he saw that wax had been rubbed over the wood to bring out this pattern. Was this the act of savages, or of artistic men seeking to make the most of simple materials? The final effect was far superior to the drab paint and riveted steel rooms of the city-dwelling Pyrans. Wasn't it true that both ends of the artistic scale were dominated by simplicity? The untutored aborigine made a simple expression of a clear idea and created beauty. At the other extreme, the sophisticated critic rejected over-elaboration and decoration and sought the truthful clarity of uncluttered art. At which end of the scale was he looking now? These men were savages. He had been told that. They dressed in furs and spoke a slurred and broken language, at least Naxa did. Reese admitted he preferred faith healers to doctors, but if all this were true, where did the communicator fit into the picture, or the glowing ceiling that illuminated the room with soft light? Reese opened his eyes and stared at Jason as if seeing him for the first time. Who are you? he asked, and what are you doing here? There was a cold menace in his words, and Jason understood why. The city pyrans hated the grubbers, and without a doubt the feeling was mutual. Naxa's axe had proved that. Naxa had entered silently while they talked and stood with his fingers touching the haft of the same axe. Jason knew his life was still in jeopardy until he gave an answer that satisfied these men. He couldn't tell the truth. If they suspected he was spying among them to aid the city people, it would be the end. Nevertheless, he had to be free to talk about the survival problem. The answer hit him as soon as he had stated the problem. All this had only taken an instant to consider, as he turned back to face the invalid and he answered at once, trying to keep his voice normal and unconcerned. I'm Jason Dinault, an ecologist, so you see I have the best reasons in the universe for visiting this planet. What's an ecologist? Reese broke in. There was nothing in his voice to indicate whether he meant the question seriously or as a trap. All traces of the ease of their earlier conversation were gone. His voice had the deadliness of a stingwing's poison. Jason chose his words carefully. Simply stated, it is that branch of biology that considers the relations between organisms and their environment, how climatic and other factors affect the life forms, and how the life forms in turn affect each other and the environment. That much Jason knew was true, but he really knew very little more about the subject, so he moved on quickly. I heard reports of this planet and finally came here to study it firsthand. I did what work I could in the shelter of the city, but it wasn't enough. The people there think I'm crazy, but they finally agreed to let me make a trip out here. What arrangements have been made for your return? Naxa snapped. None, Jason told him. They seemed quite sure that I would be killed instantly and had no hope of me coming back. In fact, they refused to let me go, and I had to break away. This answer seemed to satisfy Reese, and his face cracked into a mirthless smile. They would think that, those junk men. Can't move a meter outside their own walls without an armor-plated machine as big as a barn. What did they tell you about us? Again, Jason knew a lot depended on his answer. This time he thought carefully before speaking. Well, perhaps I'll get that axe in the back of my neck for saying this, but I have to be honest. You must know what they think. They told me you were filthy and ignorant savages who smelled, and you, well, had curious customs you practiced with the animals. In exchange for food, they traded you beads and knives. Both Pyrans broke into a convulsion of laughter at this. Reese stopped soon from weakness, but Naxa laughed himself into a coughing fit and had to splash water over his head from a gourd jug. That I believe well enough, Reese said. It sounds like the stupidity they would talk. 
Those people know nothing of the world they live in. I hope the rest of what you said is true, but even if it is not, you are welcome here. You are from off-world, that I know. No junk man would have lifted a finger to save my life. You are the first off-worlder my people have ever known, and for that you are doubly welcome. We will help you in any way we can. My arm is your arm." These last words had a ritual sound to them, and when Jason repeated them, Naxa nodded at the correctness of this. At the same time, Jason felt that they were more than empty ritual. Interdependence meant survival on Pyrrhus, and he knew that these people stood together to the death against the mortal dangers around them. He hoped the ritual would include him in that protective sphere. That's enough for tonight, Rhys said. The spotted sickness has weakened me, and your medicine has turned me to jelly. You will stay here, Jason. There is a blanket, but no bed, at least for now. Enthusiasm had carried Jason this far, making him forget the 2G exertions of the long day. Now fatigue hit him a physical blow. He had dim memories of refusing food and rolling in the blanket on the floor. After that, oblivion. Chapter 17 Every square inch of his body ached where the doubled gravity had pressed his flesh to the unyielding wood of the floor. His eyes were gummy and his mouth was filled with an indescribable taste that came off in chunks. Sitting up was an effort and he had to stifle a groan as his joints cracked. Good day, Jason, Rhys called from the bed. If I didn't believe in medicine so strongly, I would be tempted to say there is a miracle in your machine that has cured me overnight. There was no doubt that he was on the mend. The inflamed patches had vanished and the burning light was gone from his eyes. He sat propped up on the bed, watching the morning sun melt the night's hailstorm into the fields. There's meat in the cabinet there, he said, and either water or visk to drink. The visk proved to be a distilled beverage of extraordinary potency that instantly cleared the fog from Jason's brain, though it did leave a slight ringing in his ears. And the meat was a tenderly smoked joint, the best food he had tasted since leaving Darkon. Taken together, they restored his faith in life and the future. He lowered his glass with a relaxed sigh and looked around. With the pressures of immediate survival and exhaustion removed, his thoughts returned automatically to his problem. What were these people really like, and how had they managed to survive in the deadly wilderness? In the city he had been told they were savages, yet there was a carefully tended and repaired communicator on the wall, and by the door a crossbow that fired machined metal bolts. He could see the tool marks still visible on their shanks. The one thing he needed was more information. He could start by getting rid of some of his misinformation. Rhys, you laughed when I told you what the city people said about trading you trinkets for food. What do they really trade you? Anything within certain limits, Rhys said. Small manufactured items, such as electronic components for our communicators, uh, rustless alloys we can't make in our forges, cutting tools, atomic electric converters that produce power from any radioactive element, things like that. Within reason they'll trade anything we ask that isn't on the forbidden list. They need the food badly. And the items on the forbidden list? Weapons, of course, or anything that might be made into a powerful weapon. They, they know we make gunpowder, so we can't get anything like large castings or seamless tubing we could make into heavy gun barrels. We drill our own rifle barrels by hand, though the crossbow is quiet and faster in the jungle. Then they don't like us to know very much, so the only reading matter that gets to us are tech maintenance manuals, empty of basic theory. The last band category you know about, medicine. This is the one thing I cannot understand that makes me burn with hatred with every death they might have prevented. I know their reasons, Jason said. Then tell me, because I, I can think of none. Survival, it's just that simple. I doubt if you realize it, but they have a decreasing population. It is just a matter of years before they will be gone, whereas your people at least must have a stable, if not slightly growing population, to have existed without their mechanical protections. So in the city they hate you and are jealous of you at the same time. If they gave you medicine and you prospered, you would be winning the battle they have lost. I imagine they tolerate you as a necessary evil to supply them with food. Otherwise, they wish you were all dead. It makes sense, Rhys growled, slamming his fist against the bed. The kind of twisted logic you expect from junk men. 
They use us to feed them, give us the absolute minimum in return, and at the same time cut us off from the knowledge that will get us out of this hand-to-mouth existence. Worse, far worse, they cut us off from the stars and the rest of mankind. The hatred on his face was so strong that Jason unconsciously drew back. Do you think we are savages here, Jason? We act and look like animals because we have to fight for existence on an animal level. Yet we know about the stars. In that chest over there, sealed in metal, are over thirty books, all we have. Fiction, most of them, with some history and general science thrown in. Enough to keep alive the stories of the settlement here and the rest of the universe outside. We see the ships land in the city, and we know that up there are worlds we can only dream about and never see. Do you wonder that we hate these beasts that call themselves men, and would destroy them in an instant if we could? They are right to keep weapons from us, for sure as the sun rises in the morning we would kill them to a man if we were able, and take over the things they have withheld from us." It was a harsh condemnation, but essentially a truthful one, at least from the point of view of the outsiders. Jason didn't try to explain to the angry man that the city pyrans looked on their attitude as being the only possible and logical one. "'How did this battle between your two groups ever come about?' he asked. I don't know, Rhys said. I've thought about it many times, but there are no records of that period. We do know that we are all descended from colonists who arrived at the same time. Somewhere, at some time, the two groups separated. Perhaps it was a war. I've read about them in the books. I have a partial theory, though I can't prove it, that it was the location of the city. Location? I don't understand. Well. You know the junk men, and you've seen where their city is. They managed to put it right in the middle of the most savage spot on this planet. You know they don't care about any living thing except themselves. Shoot and kill is their only logic, so they wouldn't consider where to build their city and managed to build it in the stupidest spot imaginable. I'm sure my ancestors saw how foolish this was and tried to tell them so. That would be reason enough for a war, wouldn't it? It might have been, if that's really what happened, Jason said, but I think you have the problem turned backwards. It's the war between native Pyran life and humans, each fighting to destroy the other. The life forms change continually, seeking that final destruction of the invader. Your theory is even wilder than mine, Rhys said. That's not true at all. I admit that life isn't too easy on this planet, if what I have read in the books about other planets is true. But it doesn't change. You have to be fast on your feet and keep your eyes open for anything bigger than you, but you can always survive. Anyway, it doesn't really matter why. The junkmen always look for trouble, and I'm happy to see that they have enough." Jason didn't try to press the point. The effort of forcing Reese to change his basic attitudes wasn't worth it, even if possible. He hadn't succeeded in convincing anyone in the city of the lethal mutations even when they could observe all the facts. Reese could still supply information, though. I suppose it's not important who started the battle, Jason said, for the other man's benefit, not meaning a word of it. But you'll have to agree that the city people are permanently at war with all the local life. Your people, though, have managed to befriend at least two species that I have seen. Do you have any idea how this was done? Naxa will be here in a minute, Reese said, pointing to the door. As soon as he's taken care of the animals, ask him. He's the best talker we have. Talker? Jason asked. I had the opposite idea about him. He didn't talk much, and what he did say was, well, a little hard to understand at times. Not that kind of talking, Reese broke in impatiently. The talkers look after the animals. They train the dogs and Dorum, and the better ones like Naxa are always trying to work with other beasts. They dress crudely, but they have to. I've heard them say that the animals don't like chemicals, metal, or tanned leather, so they wear untanned furs for the most part. But don't let the dirt fool you. It has nothing to do with his intelligence. Dorans? Are, are those your carrying beasts, the kind we rode coming here?" Rhys nodded. Dorans are more than pack animals. They're really a little bit of everything. The large males pull the plows and other machines, while the younger animals are used for meat. If you want to know more, ask Naxa. You'll find him in the barn. I'd like to do that, Jason said, standing up, only I feel undressed without my gun. Take it, by all means. It's in that chest by the door. Only watch out what you shoot around here." Naxa was in the rear of the barn, filing down one of the spade-like toenails of a dorum. 
It was a strange scene, the fur-dressed man with the great beast, and the contrast of a beryllium copper file and electroluminescent plates lighting the work. The dorum opened its nostrils and pulled away when Jason entered. Naxa patted its neck and talked softly until it quieted and stood still, shivering slightly. Something stirred in Jason's mind, with the feeling of a long, unused muscle being stressed. A hauntingly familiar sensation. "'Good morning,' Jason said. Naxa grunted something and went back to his filing. Watching him for a few minutes, Jason tried to analyze this new feeling. It itched and slipped aside when he reached for it, escaping him. Whatever it was, it had started when Naxa had talked to the Dorum. "'Could you call one of the dogs in here, Naxa? I'd like to see one closer up.' Without raising his head from his work, Naxa gave a low whistle. Jason was sure it couldn't have been heard outside the barn. Yet within a minute one of the Pyran dogs slipped in quietly. The talker rubbed the beast's head, mumbling to it, while the animal looked intently into his eyes. The dog became restless when Naxa turned back to work on the dorum. It prowled around the barn, sniffing, then moved quickly toward the open door. Jason called it back. At least he meant to call it back. At the last moment he said nothing, nothing aloud. On sudden impulse he kept his mouth closed. Only he called the dog with his mind, thinking the words, come here, directing the impulse at the animal with all the force and direction he had ever used to manipulate dice. As he did it, he realized it had been a long time since he had even considered using his psi powers. The dog stopped and turned back towards him. It hesitated, looking at Naxa, then walked over to Jason. Seeing this closely, the beast was a nightmare hound. The hairless protective plates, tiny red-rimmed eyes, and countless saliva-dripping teeth did little to inspire confidence. Yet Jason felt no fear. There was a rapport between man and animal that was understood. Without conscious thought he reached out and scratched the dog along the back where he knew it itched. "'Didn't know you're a talker,' Naxa said as he watched them. There was friendship in his voice for the first time. "'I didn't know either until just now,' Jason said. He looked into the eyes of the animal before him, scratched the ridged and ugly back, and began to understand. The talkers must have well-developed psi facilities. That was obvious now. There is no barrier of race or alien form when two creatures share each other's emotions. Empathy first, so there would be no hatred or fear. After that, direct communication. The talkers might have been the ones who first broke through the barrier of hatred on Pyrrhus and learned to live with the native life. Others could have followed their example. This might explain how the community of grubbers had been formed. Now that he was concentrating on it, Jason was aware of the soft flow of thoughts around him. The consciousness of the dorum was matched by other like patterns from the rear of the barn. He knew without going outside that more of the big beasts were in the field back there. This is all new to me, Jason said. Have you ever thought about it, Naxa? What does it feel like to be a talker? I mean, do you know why it is you can get the animals to obey you while other people have no luck at all?" Thinking of this sort troubled Naxa. He ran his fingers through his thick hair and scowled as he answered. Never thought about it. Just do it. Just get to know the beast real good. Then you can guess what they're going to do. That's all. It was obvious that Naxa had never thought about the origins of his ability to control animals. And if he hadn't, probably no one else had. They had no reason to. They simply accepted the powers of talkers as one of the facts of life. Ideas slipped towards each other in his mind like the pieces of a puzzle joining together. He had told Kirk that the native life on Pyrrhus had joined in battle against mankind. He didn't know why. Well, he still didn't know why, but he was getting an idea of how. About how far are we from the city? Jason asked. Do you have an idea how long it would take us to get there by Durham? Half a day there, half back. Why? You want to go? I don't want to get into the city, not yet, but I would like to get close to it, Jason told him. See what Reese says, was Nax's answer. Reese granted instant permission without asking any questions. They saddled up and left at once in order to complete the round trip before dark. They had been traveling less than an hour before Jason knew they were going in the direction of the city. With each minute the feeling grew stronger. Naxa was aware of it, too, stirring in the saddle with unvoiced feelings. They had to keep touching and reassuring their mounts, which were growing skittish and restless. This is far enough, Jason said. Naxa gratefully pulled to a stop. 
The wordless thought beat through Jason's mind, filling it. He could feel it on all sides, only much stronger ahead of them in the direction of the unseen city. Naxa and the Dorams reacted in the same way, restless, uh, uncomfortable, not knowing the cause. One thing was obvious now. The Pyrran animals were sensitive to psi radiation, probably the plants and lower life forms as well. Perhaps they communicated by it, since they obeyed the men who had a strong control of it. And in this area was a wash of psi radiation such as he had never experienced before. Though his personal talent specialized in psychokinesis, the mental control of inanimate matter, he was still sensitive to most mental phenomena. Watching a sports event, he had many times felt the unanimous accord of many minds expressing the same thought. What he felt now was like that, only terribly different. A crowd exulted at some success on the field or groaned at a failure. The feeling fluxed and changed as the game progressed. Here the wash of thought was unending, strong, and frightening. It didn't translate into words very well. It was part hatred, part fear, and all destruction. Kill the enemy was as close as Jason could express it, but it was more than that, an unending river of mental outrage and death. Let's go back now, he said, suddenly battered and sickened by the feelings he had let wash through him. As they started the return trip, he began to understand many things. His sudden unspeakable fear when the Pyrran animal had attacked him that first day on the planet, and his recurrent nightmares that had never completely ceased, even with drugs. Both of these were his reaction to the hatred directed at the city, though for some reason he hadn't felt it directly up to now. Enough had reached through to him to get a strong emotional reaction. Reese was asleep when they got back, and Jason couldn't talk to him until morning. In spite of his fatigue from the trip, he stayed awake late into the night, going over in his mind the discoveries of the day. Could he tell Reese what he had found out? Not very well. If he did that, he would have to explain the importance of his discovery and what he meant to use it for. Nothing that aided the city dwellers would appeal to Reese in the slightest. Best to say nothing until the entire affair was over. Chapter 18 After breakfast he told Reese that he wanted to return to the city. Then you've seen enough of our barbarian world and wish to go back to your friends to help them wipe us out, perhaps? Reese said it lightly, but there was a touch of cold malice behind his words. I hope you don't really think that, Jason told him. You must realize that the opposite is true. I would like to see this civil war ended and your people getting all the benefits of science and medicine that have been withheld. I'll do everything I can to bring that about." They'll never change, Reese said gloomily. Don't waste your time. But there's one thing you must do, for your protection and ours. Don't admit, or even hint, that you've talked to any grubbers. Why not? Why not? Suffering, death, are you that simple? They will do anything to see that we don't rise too high and would much prefer to see us all dead. Do you think they would hesitate to kill you if they as much as suspected you had contacted us? They realize, even if you don't, that you can single-handedly alter the entire pattern of power on this planet. The ordinary junk man may think of us as being only one step above the animals, but the leaders don't. They know what we need and what we want. They could probably guess just what it is I'm going to ask you. Help us, Jason Dinault. Get back among those human pigs and lie. Say you never talked to us, that you hid in the forest and we attacked you, and you had to shoot to save yourself. We'll supply some recent corpses to make that part of your story sound good. Make them believe you, and even after you think you have them convinced, keep on acting the part because they will be watching you. Then tell them you have finished your work and are ready to leave. Get safely off Pyrus to another planet, and I promise you, anything in the universe, whatever you want, you shall have power, money, anything. This is a rich planet. The junk men mine and sell the metal, but we could do it much better. Bring a spaceship back here and land anywhere on this continent. We have no cities, but our people have farms everywhere. They will find you. We will then have commerce, trade, on our own. This is what we all want, and we will work hard for it. And you will have done it. Whatever you want, we will give. That is a promise, and we do not break our promises." The intensity and magnitude of what he described rocked Jason. 
He knew that Rhes spoke the truth, and the entire resources of the planet would be his if he did as asked. For one second he was tempted, savoring the thought of what it would be like. Then came realization that it would be a half-answer, and a poor one at that. If these people had the strength they wanted, their first act would be the attempted destruction of the city men. The result would be bloody civil war that would probably destroy them both. Reese's answer was a good one, but only half an answer. Jason had to find a better solution, one that would stop all the fighting on this planet and allow the two groups of humans to live in peace. I will do nothing to injure your people, Reese, and everything in my power to aid them, Jason said. This half-answer satisfied Reese, who could see only one interpretation of it. He spent the rest of the morning on the communicator arranging for the food supplies that were being brought to the trading site. The supplies are ready, and we have sent the signal, he said. The truck will be there tomorrow, and you will be waiting for it. Everything is arranged, as I told you. You'll leave now with Naxa. You must reach the meeting spot before the trucks. Chapter 19 the truck's almost here. You know what to do? Naxa asked. Jason nodded and looked again at the dead man. Some beast had torn his arm off and he had bled to death. The severed arm had been tied into the shirt sleeve, so from a distance it looked normal. Seen close up, this limp arm plus the white skin and shocked expression on the face gave Jason an unhappy sensation. He liked to see his corpses safely buried. However, he could understand its importance today. Here they are. Wait until his back's turned, Naxa whispered. The armored truck had three powered trailers in tow this time. The train ground up the rock slope and whined to a stop. Krannon climbed out of the cab and looked carefully around before opening up the trailers. He had a lift robot along to help him with the loading. Now, Naxa hissed. Jason burst into the clearing, running, shouting Krannon's name. There was a crackling behind him as two of the hidden men hurled the corpse through the foliage after him. He turned and fired without stopping, setting the thing afire in mid-air. There was a crack of another gun as Krannon fired. His shot jarred the twice-dead corpse before it hit the ground. Then he was lying prone, firing into the trees behind the running Jason. Just as Jason reached the truck, there was a whirring in the air and hot pain ripped into his back, throwing him to the ground. He looked around as Krannon dragged him through the door and saw the metal shaft of a crossbow sticking out of his shoulder. Lucky, the Pyron said, an inch lower would have got your heart. I warned you about those grubbers. You're lucky to get off with only this. He lay next to the door and snapped shots into the now quiet wood. Taking out the bolt hurt much more than it had going in. Jason cursed the pain as Krannon put on a dressing and admired the singleness of purpose of the people who had shot him. They had risked his life to make his escape look real, and also risked the chance that he might turn against them after being shot. They did a job completely and thoroughly, and he cursed them for their efficiency. Krannon climbed warily out of the truck after Jason was bandaged. Finishing the loading quickly, he started the train of trailers back towards the city. Jason had an anti-pain shot and dozed off as soon as they started. While he slept, Krannon must have radioed ahead because Kirk was waiting when they arrived. As soon as the truck entered the perimeter, he threw open the door and dragged Jason out. The bandage pulled, and Jason felt the wound tear. He ground his teeth together. Kirk would not have the satisfaction of hearing him cry out. I told you to stay in the buildings until the ship left. Why, why did you leave? Why did you go outside? You, you talked to the grubbers, didn't you? With each question, he shook Jason again. I didn't talk to anyone, Jason managed to get the words out. They tried to take me. I shot two, hit out until the trucks came back. Got another one then, Krannon said. I saw it. Good shooting. Think I got some too. Let him go, Kirk. They shot him in the back before he could reach the truck. That's enough explanations, Jason thought to himself. Don't overdo it. Let him make up his mind later. Now's the time to change the subject. There's one thing that will get his mind off the grubbers. I've been fighting your war for you, Kirk, while you stayed safely inside the perimeter. Jason leaned back against the side of the truck as the other loosened his grip. I found out what your battle with this planet is really about, and how you can win it. Now let me sit down and I'll tell you. More Pyrans had come up while they talked. None of them moved now, like Kirk. They stood frozen, looking at Jason. When Kirk talked, he spoke for all of them. What do you mean? Just what I said. Pyrus is fighting you. 
actively and consciously. Get far enough out from this city and you can feel the waves of hatred that are directed at it. No, that's wrong. You can't because you've grown up with it. But I can. And so could anyone else with any sort of psi sensitivity. There is a message of war being beamed against you constantly. The life forms of this planet are psi sensitive and respond to that order. They attack and change and mutate for your destruction and they'll keep on doing so until you're all dead. Unless you can stop the war. How? Kirk snapped the word and every face echoed the question. By finding whoever or whatever is sending that message. The life forms that attack you have no reasoning intelligence. They are being ordered to do so. I think I know how to find the source of these orders. After that, it will be a matter of getting across a message, uh, asking for a truce and an eventual end to all hostilities. A dead silence followed his words as the Pyrans tried to comprehend the ideas. Kirk moved first, waving them all away. Go back to your work. This is my responsibility and I'll take care of it. As soon as I find out what truth there is here, if any, I'll make a complete report. The people drifted away silently, looking back as they went. Chapter 20 From the beginning now, Kirk said, and leave out nothing. There is very little more I can add to the physical facts. I saw the animals, understood the message, I even experimented with some of them, and they reacted to my mental commands. What I must do now is track down the source of the orders that keep this war going. I'll tell you something that I have never told anyone else. I'm not only lucky at gambling, I have enough psi ability to alter probability in my favor. It's an erratic ability that I have tried to improve for obvious reasons. During the past ten years I managed to study at all of the centers that do psi research. Compared to other fields of knowledge it's amazing how little they know. Basic psi talents can be improved by practice, and some machines have been devised that act as psionic amplifiers. One of these, used correctly, is a very good directional indicator. You want to build this machine? Kirk asked. Exactly. Build it and take it outside the city in the ship. Any signal strong enough to keep this centuries-old battle going should be strong enough to track down. I'll follow it, contact the creatures who are sending it, and try to find out why they're doing it. I assume you'll go along with any reasonable plan that will end this war. Anything reasonable, Kirk said coldly. How long will it take you to build this machine? Just a few days if you have all the parts here, Jason told him. Then do it. I'm canceling the flight that's leaving now, and I'll keep the ship here ready to go. When the machine is built, I want you to track the signal and report back to me. Agreed, Jason said, standing up. As soon as I have this hole in my back looked at, I'll draw up a list of things needed. A grim, unsmiling man named Scop was assigned to Jason as a combination guide and guard. He took his job very seriously, and it didn't take Jason long to realize that he was a prisoner at large. Kirk had accepted his story, but that was no guarantee that he believed it. At a single word from him, the guard could turn executioner. The chill thought hit Jason that undoubtedly this was what would happen. Whether Kirk accepted the story or not, he couldn't afford to take a chance. As long as there was the slightest possibility Jason had contacted the grubbers, he couldn't be allowed to leave the planet alive. The woods people were being simple if they thought a plan this obvious might succeed, or had they just gambled on the very long chance that it might work. They certainly had nothing to lose by it. Only half of Jason's mind was occupied with the work as he drew up a list of materials he would need for the psionic direction finder. His thoughts plotted in tight circles, searching for a way out that didn't exist. He was too deeply involved now to just leave. Kirk would see to that. Unless he could find a way to end the war and settle the grubber question, he was marooned on Pyrus for life. A very short life. When the list was ready, he called supply. With a few substitutions, everything he might possibly need was in stock and would be sent over. Scop sank into an apparent doze in his chair, and Jason, his head propped against the pull of gravity by one arm, began a working sketch of his machine. Jason looked up suddenly, aware of the silence. He could hear machinery in the building and voices in the hall outside. What kind of silence, then? Mental silence. He had been so preoccupied since his return to the city that he hadn't noticed the complete lack of any kind of psi sensation. The constant wash of animal reactions was missing, as was the vague tactile awareness of his PK. With sudden realization he remembered that it was always this way inside the city. 
He tried to listen with his mind, and stopped almost before he began. There was a constant press of thought about him that he was made aware of when he reached out. It was like being in a vessel far beneath the ocean with your hand on the door that held back the frightening pressure. Touching the door without opening it, you could feel the stresses, the power pushing in and waiting to crush you. It was this way with the psi pressure on the city. The unvoiced, hate-filled screams of Pyrrus could instantly destroy any mind that received them. Some function of his brain acted as a psi circuit breaker, shutting off awareness before his mind could be blasted. There was just enough leak through to keep him aware of the pressure and supply the raw materials for his constant nightmares. There was only one fringe benefit. The lack of thought pressure made it easier for him to concentrate. In spite of his fatigue, the diagram developed swiftly. Meta arrived late that afternoon, bringing the parts he had ordered. She slid the long box onto the workbench, started to speak, but changed her mind and said nothing. Jason looked up at her and smiled. Confused? he asked. I don't know what you mean, she said. I'm not confused, just annoyed. The regular trip has been canceled and our supply schedule will be thrown off for months to come. And instead of piloting or perimeter assignment, all I can do is stand around and wait for you. Then take some silly flight following your directions. Do you wonder that I'm annoyed? Jason carefully set the parts out on the chassis before he spoke. As I said, you're confused. I can point out how you're confused, which will make you even more confused, a temptation that I frankly find hard to resist. She looked across the bench at him, frowning, one finger unconsciously curling and uncurling a short lock of hair. Jason liked her this way. As a Pyrran operating at full blast, she had as much personality as a gear in a machine. Once out of that pattern, she reminded him more of the girl he had known on that first flight to Pyrrhus. He wondered if it was possible to really get across to her what he meant. I'm not being insulting when I say confused, Meta. With your background, you couldn't be any other way. You have an insular personality. Admittedly, Pyrrhus is an unusual island with a lot of high-power problems that you are an expert at solving. That doesn't make it any less of an island. When you face a cosmopolitan problem, you are confused, or even worse, when your island problems are put into a bigger context. That's like playing your own game, only having the rules change constantly as you go along. You're talking nonsense, she snapped at him. Pyrrhus isn't an island, and battling for survival is definitely not a game. I'm sorry, he smiled. I was using a figure of speech and a badly chosen one at that. Let's put the problem on more concrete terms. Take an example. Suppose I were to tell you that over there hanging from the door frame was a stingwing. Meta's gun was pointing at the door before he finished the last word. There was a crash as the guard's chair went over. He had jumped from a half doze to full alertness in an instant, his gun also searching the door frame. That was just an example, Jason said. There's really nothing there. The guard's gun vanished and he scowled a look of contempt at Jason as he righted the chair and dropped into it. You both have proved yourself capable of handling a Pyrran problem, Jason continued, but what if I said that there is a thing hanging from the door frame that looks like a stingwing, but is really a kind of large insect that spins a fine silk that can be used to weave clothes? The guard glared from under his thick eyebrows at the empty door frame. His gun whined part way out, then snapped back into the holster. He growled something inaudible at Jason, then stamped into the outer room, slamming the door behind him. Meta frowned in concentration and looked puzzled. It couldn't be anything except a stingwing, she finally said. Nothing else could possibly look like that, and even if it didn't spin silk, it would bite if you got near, so you would have to kill it. She smiled with satisfaction at the indestructible logic of her answer. Wrong again, Jason said. I just described the mimic spinner that lives on Stover's planet. It imitates the most violent forms of life there, does such a good job that it has no need for other defenses. It'll sit quietly on your hand and spin for you by the yard. If I dropped a shipload of them here on Pyrrhus, you never could be sure when to shoot, could you? But they are not here now, Meta insisted. Yet they could be quite easily, and if they were, all the rules of your game would change. Getting the idea now? There are some fixed laws and rules in the galaxy. But they're not the ones you live by. Your rule is war, unending, with the local life. I want to step outside your rule book and end that war. 
Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like an existence that was more than just an endless battle for survival? A life with a chance for happiness, love, music, art, all the enjoyable things you have never had time for. All the Pyrran sternness was gone from her face as she listened to what he said, letting herself follow these alien concepts. He had put his hand out automatically as he talked and had taken hers. It was warm and her pulse fast to the touch. Meta suddenly became conscious of his hand and snapped hers away, rising to her feet at the same time. As she started blindly towards the door, Jason's voice snapped after her. The guard, Scop, ran out because he didn't want to lose his precious two-value logic. It's all he has. But you've seen other parts of the galaxy, Meta. You know there is a lot more to life than kill and be killed on Pyrrhus. You feel it is true, even if you won't admit it. She turned and ran out the door. Jason looked after her, his hand scraping the bristle on his chin thoughtfully. Meta, I have the faint hope that the woman is winning over the Pyrran. I think that I saw, perhaps for the first time in the history of this bloody war-torn city, a tear in one of its citizens' eyes. Chapter 21 Drop that equipment and Kirk will undoubtedly pull both your arms off, Jason said. He's over there now, looking as sorry as possible that I ever talked him into this." Scop cursed under the bulky mass of the psi detector, passing it up to Meta, who waited in the open port of the spaceship. Jason supervised the loading and blasted all the local life that came to investigate. Horn devils were thick this morning, and he shot four of them. He was last aboard and closed the lock behind him. "'Where are you going to install it?' Meta asked. You tell me, Jason said, I need a spot for the antenna where there will be no dense metal in front of the bowl to interfere with the signal. Thin plastic will do, or if worse comes to worse I can mount it outside the hull with a remote drive. You may have to, she said. The hull is an unbroken unit. We do all viewing by screen and instruments. I don't think... Wait, there is one place that might do. She led the way to a bulge in the hull that marked one of the lifeboats. They went in through the always open lock, Scop struggling after them with the apparatus. These lifeboats are half buried in the ship, Meta explained. They have transparent front ports covered by friction shields that withdraw automatically when the boat is launched. Can we pull back the shields now? I think so, she said. She traced the launching circuits to a junction box and opened the lid. When she closed the shield relay manually, the heavy plates slipped back into the hull. There was a clear view, since most of the viewport projected beyond the parent ship. Perfect, Jason said. I'll set up here. Now, how do I talk to you in the ship? Right here, she said. There's a pre-tuned setting on this communicator. Don't touch anything else, and particularly not this switch. She pointed to a large pull handle set square into the center of the control board. Emergency launching. Two seconds after that is pulled, the lifeboat is shot free and it so happens this boat has no fuel. Hands off for sure, Jason said. Now have Husky there run me in a line with ship's power and I'll get this stuff set up. The detector was simple, though the tuning had to be precise. A dish-shaped antenna pulled in the signal for the delicately balanced detector. There was a sharp fall-off on both sides of the input so direction could be precisely determined. The resulting signal was fed to an amplifier stage. Unlike the electronic components of the first stage, this one was drawn in symbols on white paper. Carefully glued on input and output leads ran to it. When everything was ready and clamped into place, Jason nodded to Meta's image on the screen. Take her up, and easy please, none of your 9G specials. Go into a slow circle around the perimeter until I tell you differently. Under steady power the ship lifted and grabbed for altitude, then eased into its circular course. They made five circuits of the city before Jason shook his head. The thing seems to be working fine, but we're getting too much noise from all the local life. Get thirty kilometers out of the city and start a new circuit. The results were better this time. A powerful signal came from the direction of the city, confined to less than a degree of arc. With the antenna fixed at a right angle to the direction of the ship's flight, the signal was fairly constant. Meta rotated the ship on its main axis until Jason's lifeboat was directly below. Going fine now, he said. Just hold your controls as they are and keep the nose from drifting. After making a careful mark on the setting circle, Jason turned the receiving antenna through 180 degrees of arc. 
As the ship kept to its circle, he made a slow collecting sweep of any signals beamed at the city. They were halfway around before he got a new signal. It was there, all right, narrow, but strong. Just to be sure, he let the ship complete two more sweeps, and he noted the direction on the gyro compass each time. They coincided. The third time around, he called to Meta. Get ready for a full right turn, or whatever you call it. I think I have our bearing. Get ready. Now. It was a slow turn, and Jason never lost the signal. A few times it wavered, but he brought it back on. When the compass settled down, Meta pushed on more power. They set their course towards the native Pyrans. An hour's flight at close to top atmospheric speed brought no change. Meta complained, but Jason kept her on course. The signal never varied and was slowly picking up strength. They crossed the chain of volcanoes that marked the continental limits, the ship bucking in the fierce thermals. Once the shore was behind and they were over water, Scott joined Meta in grumbling. He kept his turret spinning, but there was very little to shoot at this far from land. When the islands came over the horizon, the signal began to dip. Slow now, Jason called. Those islands ahead look like our source. A continent had been here once, floating on Pyrus's liquid core. Pressures changed, land masses shifted, and the continent had sunk beneath the ocean. All that was left now of the teeming life of that landmass was confined to a chain of islands once the mountain peaks of the highest range of mountains. These islands, whose sheer sides rose straight from the water, held the last inhabitants of the lost continent. The weeded-out descendants of the victors of uncountable violent contests. Here lived the oldest native Pyrans. Come in lower, Jason signaled, towards that large peak. The signals seemed to originate there. They swooped low over the mountain, but nothing was visible other than the trees and sun-blasted rock. The pain almost took Jason's head off, a blast of hatred that drove through the amplifier and into his skull. He tore off the phones and clutched his skull between his hands. Through watering eyes he saw the black cloud of flying beasts hurtle up from the trees below. He had a single glimpse of the hillside beyond, before Meta blasted power to the engines and the ship leaped away. We've found them, her fierce exultation faded as she saw Jason through the communicator. Are you all right? W what happened? Feel burned out. I've felt a side blast before, but nothing like that. I had a glimpse of an opening, looked like a cave mouth, just before the blast hit. Seemed to come from there. Lie down, Meta said. I'll get you back as fast as I can. I'm calling ahead to Kirk. He has to know what happened. A group of men were waiting in the landing station when they came down. They stormed out as soon as the ship touched, shielding their faces from the still hot tubes. Kirk burst in as soon as the port was cracked, peering around until he spotted Jason stretched out on an acceleration couch. Is it true, he barked, you traced the alien criminals who started this war? Slow, man, slow, Jason said. I've traced the source of the psi message that keeps your war going. I found no evidence as to who started this war, and certainly wouldn't go so far as to call them criminals. I'm tired of your wordplay, Kirk broke in. You've found these creatures and their location has been marked? On the chart, Meta said, I could fly there blindfolded. Fine, fine, Kirk said, rubbing his hands together so hard they could hear the harsh rasp of the calluses. It takes a real effort to grasp the idea that, after all these centuries, the war might be coming to an end. But it's possible now, instead of simply killing off these self-renewing legions of the damned that attack us, we can get to the leaders, search them out, carry the war to them for a change, and blast their stain from the face of this planet. Nothing of the sort, Jason said, sitting up with an effort. Nothing doing. Since I came to this planet, I have been knocked around and risked my life ten times over. Do you think I have done this just to satisfy your bloodthirsty ambitions? It's peace I'm after, not destruction. You promised to contact these creatures, attempt to negotiate with them. Aren't you a man of honor who keeps his word? I'll ignore the insult, though I'd have killed you for it at any other time, Kirk said. You've been of great service to our people, and we are not ashamed to acknowledge an honest debt. At the same time, do not accuse me of breaking promises that I never made. I recall my exact words. I promised to go along with any reasonable plan that would end this war. That is just what I intend to do. Your plan to negotiate a peace is not reasonable. Therefore, we are going to destroy the enemy. Think first, Jason called after Kirk, who had turned to leave. 
What is wrong with trying negotiation or an armistice? Then, if it fails, you can try your way." The compartment was getting crowded as other Pyrrans pushed in. Kirk, almost to the door, turned back to face Jason. I'll tell you what's wrong with armistice, he said. It's a coward's way out, that's what it is. It's all right for you to suggest it. You're from off-world and don't know any better. But do you honestly think I could entertain such a defeatist notion for one instant? When I speak, I speak not only for myself, but for all of us here. We don't mind fighting, and we do know how to do it. We know that if this war was over, we could build a better world here. At the same time, if we have the choice of continued war or a cowardly peace, we vote for war. This war will only be over when the enemy is utterly destroyed." The listening Pyrrans shouted in agreement, and when Kirk pushed out through the crowd, some of them patted his shoulders as he went by. Jason slumped back on the couch, worn out by his exertions and exhausted by the attempt to win the violent Pyrrans over to a peaceful point of view. When he looked up they were gone, all except Meta. She had the same look of bloodthirsty elation as the others, but it drained away when she glanced at him. "'What about it, Meta?' he asked bitterly. "'No doubts? Do you think that destruction is the only way to end this war?' "'I don't know,' she said. "'I can't be sure. For the first time in my life I find myself with more than one answer to the same question.' "'Congratulations,' he said. "'It's a sign of growing up.'